Well, as mariners in the Indian Ocean know, the age of piracy is not over. 21st century captains don't have to worry about the likes of, like, Blackbeard or Black Bart or Jose Gaspar or Jean Lafitte or Jack Sparrow. They have to worry about boatloads of Somali pirates who skim across the waves and overtake the slow moving container ships many times their size. Pirate assaults these days are more about speed and proximity and brutality. If the pirates can get within range, they can quickly overwhelm a lightly armed crew of merchant marines with their automatic gunfire and their bloodthirsty ways. Fortunately, many merchant marine ships and other cruise ships in the Indian Ocean are now equipped with a defensive device that drives the pirates away. It's called a sonic cannon, or in a Navy jargon, LRAD, which stands for Long Range Acoustical Device. The Navy deployed LRADs soon after the disastrous 2000 terrorist bombing of the USS Cole off the coast of Yemen. One of the first successful uses of this technology happened, though, in a civilian cruise ship called the Seaborne Spirit. They were being attacked by a couple boatloads of Somali pirates. And as the Somali pirates drew close to the ship, still the 115 passengers, mostly a, still a slumber and asleep in their, in their bunks there, they started spraying the ship with automatic weapons fire. The crew tried to swamp the boats with their uh, fire hoses, but it was the LRAD that saved the day. The weapon looks kind of like a small uh, satellite dish. A crew member pointed it at the speedboat and hit the pirates with 150 decibels of sound. That's like standing right next to the speakers of an ACDC rock concert. It is such a powerful blast of sound that it causes excruciating headaches and severe ear pain and can even cause eardrum rupture. It can cause a temporary loss of vision as well as other physiological problems. In this case, though, the seaborne spirit, with the seaborne spirit, it caused the pirates to turn tail and flee. Now, LRAD technology belongs to the 21st century, but its concept is a lot older, as old as the Bible itself. Because you see, the author of Psalm 29 envisions something like LRAD when he imagines the impact of the voice of the Lord. Remember the psalm that we read? The voice of the Lord thunders, boom. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars, crack. The voice of the Lord bursts forth, or flashes forth flames of fire, snap. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness, crash. The voice of the Lord causes the wild oaks to whirl. Whoosh. And then it says, all God's people shouted, kavod, glory. You see, the psalmist here portrays God as a storm God. The God of Israel is a storm God, much more powerful than Baal, the storm God of the Canaanites. The Yahweh storm, though, um, didn't drive people to the disreputable high places, but it drives them, as the psalmist says, to the temple. No doubt that this psalm was used as part of temple worship on some high holy day. God's storm voice is echoed by the members of the worshiping congregation who thunder back to him, glory. And in that respect, the sonic boom of God's voice is different from that of Elrad. Elrad is meant to drive people away screaming. 
But the sonic boom of God's voice actually draws people to come to the temple. The vox dei, the voice of God, goes out and draws the nations in awe and enables the people to say, glory. Now, as eager as we think we are to hear the voice of God, we're remarkably resistant to it. Although the world is filled with signs of God's glory all around us, our vision of the glory is impaired. In part, um, it, this is because our inner faculties of perception are dulled and distorted. And when we are not alert within ourselves, then we don't even see the glory, even as it is glaring at us, as bright as the rising sun. Just a couple weeks ago, we celebrated the nativity of uh, the Lord's birth, God in living word, in the flesh, the light that enlightens all humanity. But this nativity, we quickly and typically picture it as not a overwhelming wall of sound. In fact, we kind of go the opposite direction, don't we? Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Or again, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. But let's not abandon the psalmist's wall of sound so quickly. Our desire for Christmas peace may lead us to treasure the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Yet Jesus coming into the world is a far powerful event. Far so, so powerful that its reverberations still shake our soul today. The Christmas story from Luke is really a telling of how the powerful Messiah is come into the world. When we think about the Luke 2 story and the, the angelic chorus, we kind of think about a sweet band of choristers, but it's really, it talks about God's heavenly hosts, his angelic army armed to the teeth and chanting in cadence with a platoon leader, glory to God in the highest. Scripture also calls Jesus Logos, the word of God. So if the voice of the Lord that causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare, we surely can trust this babe in the manger or more properly the man he grew up to be to shake us out of our sin and complacency as well. You see, Psalm 29 is connected with the gospel lesson from the first chapter of Mark on this day, the baptism of Jesus. And you notice in that gospel lesson, we also have another auditory experience that happens. God's voice booms from heaven again and says, this is my beloved son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And yet as powerful as the voice of the Lord can be, it is hard for us at times to hear it echo in our daily lives. It's not like the Elrad in that sense. Hearing the Lord's voice requires discernment. And discernment is an ancient concept. It is a cherished prize of the contemplative crowd. You know, there's a kind of a secular meaning to discernment and a spiritual meaning. The secular meaning of discernment is being able to pick out an item amongst many that are around there, like the face of a friend in the middle of a high school choir on, a, on the stands, or being able to pick out your car in a parking lot full of cars, or being able to pick out the voice of your granddaughter amongst all the other voices that you hear out in the crowd. We in the church need spiritual discernment. 
And there was a time when it was just as easy as just kneeling down at the feet of Jesus, like at the Sermon of the Mount or in the upper room at the Lord's, at Lord's uh, Last Supper there where the bread and the wine was given to them knowing that this was his body and blood. But no more. Jesus doesn't walk among us anymore. He has been raised from the dead and has ascended into heaven. His continued presence in the form of the Holy Spirit is a lot harder to pick out now amongst the millions of brothers and sisters' voices, their whispers and their shouts that we hear. Frederick Buechner, who's a noted theologian, once said, we're so used to hearing what we want to hear while remaining deaf to what we well ought to hear. It's a hard habit to break, he says. But, he says, if we listen with our head in our hearts and open our ears, listen with patience and hope, then however faintly we can hear the voice of God speaking to us. And what little that we understand of what he is saying to us, yet those words are recoverable and are joyous beyond telling. You see, we don't only listen to God with our ears. We hear God in a spiritual sense by means of the divine voice that resonates in our soul. Yes, yet how can we tell that that's God speaking to us and not something within us or even coming from some darker place? Here are a few questions to ask ourselves to help make this determination. Is it consistent with Scripture? One of the first principles of interpretation is that Scripture interprets itself. If it's not consistent with Scripture, it's not coming from God. Does it serve God's purposes? Does it direct me along the path of humility? Not to make ourselves look better, a voice that says, hey, this will make you stand out in the crowd, <laughs> probably isn't the voice of the Lord. The Lord directs us along the path of humility. And then, is it, is it, um, can't read that, confirmed <laughs> by what others are discerning? Do others hear that voice for you as well. Now the author of Hebrews, though, tells us Christians how we can most reliably hear the voice of God today. Remember what Hebrews 1.1 says? In the past, God spoke to our forefathers in many and various ways through the prophets. But in these latter days, he has spoken to us through his Son. Catch that? God has spoken to us through his Son. You know, lots of people spend their whole lives hoping that one day they would hear the voice of God, that they would have this unequivocal uh, proof of the reliability of faith. Yet, we don't need to wait for an advancing wall of sound to hit us like an auditory tsunami. We can hear it in a much simpler way, by entering into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and following Him. God doesn't need a sonic boom to get His point across. God doesn't need to whirl the oaks and strip the forest bare to hear him. God only needs to point us to that Galilean carpenter who appeared one day on the Jordan River, baptized by John, 
And the voice of God says, This is my beloved Son whom I love. God speaks to us through Jesus. And Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Through Jesus, we hear God's booming voice of grace and mercy. Through Jesus, we hear God's shouting of his love for the whole world. In Jesus alone is our salvation. As John the Baptist says, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In these quieter days after Christmas, we have a time to come into the house, to the temple of our Lord, and we can add our shouts of praise and glory to our God as well. The message he gives us is the same message he gave the shepherds and the magi and the people, the faithful people down through the ages. It's that God speaks to us through Jesus. Even today. Yes, even today. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.